Good evening and welcome. I'd like to call the June 20, 2019 board meeting for Johnson County Community College to order. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, next item is roll call and recognition of visitors. Uh, Ms. Schleist. Okay. This evening's visitors include Val Ball, Eldon Shields, Ron Contino, Jamea Haynes, Roberta Eveslage, Mo Azim, Pauline Cunningham, Lori Bell, and Cassandra Peters. Thank you. Thank you for your attendance. We appreciate you being here tonight. Awards and recognitions, Dr. Sopcich. Uh, Dr. Cook, we have no awards or recognitions okay. this evening. Next item is the open forum. It's a section on the board agenda that is a time for members of the community to provide comments to the board. There will be one open forum period during each regularly scheduled board meeting. Comments are limited to five minutes unless a significant number of people plan to speak. In that instance, the chair may limit a person's comments to less than five minutes. In order to be recognized, individuals must register at the door at each board meeting prior to the open forum agenda item. When addressing the board, registered speakers are asked to remain at the podium, should be respectful and civil, and are encouraged to address individual personnel or student matters directly with the appropriate college department. As a practice, the college does not respond in this setting when the matter concerns personnel or student issues or matters that are being addressed through our established grievance or suggestion processes or are otherwise a subject of review by the college or board. There are two registered speakers tonight. We'd ask you to come to the podium, state your name and address, and the first up is Chris Rosal. Good evening, members of the board, members of the community. I'm Chris Roselle from Roland Park. I'm a student here, and I'm also running for the board this year. Voting is important to me, as I imagine you've gathered. The first election I remember was President Eisenhower's first election. When I was in the seminary, President Kennedy was assassinated. I enrolled in the Air Force Academy the year after the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. The first time I ever voted, Reverend King and Senator Kennedy had just been assassinated. And a gentleman called, and I use the term loosely, named Lester Maddox, was on my ballot running for governor of my state. I assume you know enough history to know who Lester Maddox was and about his axe handles that he stocked his restaurant with in case any people of another ethnic group desired service there. During Watergate, I enrolled in the Peace Corps as a health worker, I've had the privilege of working with about a million mothers and children and saving lives in Asia, Africa, and throughout the Americas. You may know about my work this year in El Paso and in Uganda. To summarize, I have seen amazing and terrible changes in my lifetime, both. As a result, voting is vital to me as it is to you. To that point, we have a primary and general election that impacts Johnson County Community College this year. I was told to read the board's policy regarding impartiality, which I did and I studied closely. I've been told by staff and other people that no information can be shared in the college about the election and no information about candidates. However, information is impartial. Information is not promoting, is not endorsing. Information is how we become educated. 
I would like to point out that the current way that things are being managed as far as sharing information about candidates implicitly endorses and promotes incumbents. I say that in that incumbents have their resumes, have their pictures, for obvious reasons, on the website, but no candidates for election have their names or their resumes published anywhere on the website. And the implicit effect of that, the actual effect, is to improve the electability of incumbents. So my questions are, given the importance of voting, what will the college do to publicize the dates and the candidates of this year's election? Will you announce the election and candidates on the internal communication system? Will you publicize the election on the college's website? This is an election that affects the college. Keeping the constituency of the college ill-informed or uninformed results in an uninformed election, which we don't want. That's all. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm not sure that we have not promoted the dates, but we'll, uh, we'll review what you have said tonight and take care of that. Second person is Val Ball. Hi, uh, my name is Val Ball. Uh, rhymes with foul ball because sometimes I'm out of line. I like to use that as my disclaimer. I don't want to get out of line tonight. Um, I've learned my lessons as where the lines are as I go. Um, I am a candidate for the Johnson County Community College Board of Trustees this year, um, but I come to the board um, to address an issue that has been raised with the board a couple times and nothing has been done. Um, so I'd like to request of this board to change the name of the Carlson Center um, the most popular building on campus um, carries a name tarnished in scandal, and it is unlikely that many students on campus are aware of the baggage that comes along with the building's namesake. I myself am an alum of Johnson County Community College. I attended early childhood uh, education classes when I was an early child care educator um, to receive my uh, credential in early childhood development. I also returned to Johnson County Community College having a bachelor's degree um, in political science and Spanish. I came back to utilize the paralegal studies program. And I graduated in 2006 at the same time that Carlson was resigning amid sexual harassment allegations. And I, as a student, had no idea that this was going on. Um, this has been brought up by the campus ledger in 2008. It was also uh, brought up by the campus ledger in 2015 uh, during the 25th anniversary of the Carlson Center. It was requested to restore the original name of the Cultural Education Center. So I'm here to ask the board to change the name to stop this uh, needless issue from being an issue anymore. Um, time's up in the Me Too era we don't have time to have Johnson County Community College, their most popular building, be the name of someone who has that kind of history. So I'd like to request the board change that name. And with that, I'll leave it to you to discuss. If you have any questions, I'm open. Thanks, Val. Appreciate Thank that. That closes our open forum. We have no other uh, presenters tonight. Uh, appreciate you coming. We'll uh, consider those points and uh, appreciate your input. At this time, we do have an executive session that we need to tend to. Um, I would like to entertain a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing a prior litigation matter with <coughs> legal counsel pursuant to the Kansas Open Meetings Act exception relating to matters deemed privileged in the attorney-client relationship. Uh, we would like to invite all trustees other than Trustee Musil, who has recused himself from the matter due to a conflict of interest. Uh, including Joe Sopcich, Barbara Larson, Tanya Wilson, Terry Schleist, and Eldon Shields to join in this executive session. Uh, we expect this session to last 15 minutes, and so uh, it is now 5.10. We need to clear the room, uh, and as soon as the room is cleared, 15 minutes later, we'll continue with our regular board meeting. Do you need a motion? I, I need move. a motion I move and a to second. Second. 
All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Chair, I'd like to explain on the record why I'm recusing. Um, my five years ago, I was with a law firm that represents the other side of this lawsuit. I was not involved in it. I'm not with that law firm anymore, but out of an abundance of caution, I will not participate in any discussions regarding this. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We have come back from executive session. No action was taken. We need to extend uh, this same executive session for another 10 minutes. Uh, discussion to prior litigation matter with legal counsel pursuant to Kansas Open Meetings Act's exception relating to matters de deemed privileged in the attorney-client relationship. And we'd like to invite all trustees other than Trustee Musil has recused himself with Joe Sopcich, Barbara Larson, Tanya Wilson, Terry Schleist, and Eldon Shields. Uh, this will begin at 529. Do I have a motion? So moved. And a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Thank you. If you would leave. We are back from the executive session. No action was taking. We taken. We thank you for your patience. We'll move on with our regular agenda. Committee reports and recommendations. Human resources. Trustee Lawson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the Human Resource Committee met on June 7th at 8 a.m. in the uh, Robert Lytle Conference Room, which is right next door to us. Uh, you can see in your board packet on page one and two more of the minutes. Uh, we talked about the, we have a recommendation to bring forward, which I'll talk about. We also mentioned some of the applicant tracking system. Uh, we also mentioned the strategic initiative. We had an employee engagement survey that uh, we've done for the last few years in 2015, 17. Um, and there were some features that we highlighted. Most favorable aspects of the survey, I feel accepted by my immediate coworkers. That was an 83%. Uh, so that was really great. I feel proud to work here, 80%. I find my work engaging. 80%, I'm inspired by the work we do at 79%. My immediate coworkers consistently go extra mile to achieve the great results, 77%. Um, we just continue to go through this survey and just look at different factors that stood out for us. Uh, anything that kind of went over a 2% uh, change we discussed and had questions about. We had some questions about the company we used, uh, how they paired us with um, a national um, bank that they have of other clients to see if that was something that was um, relatable to us and if there was potential to maybe compare us to our peer institutions um, in benchmarks around the country versus uh, we're not exactly sure who we're getting compared to. Uh, some of the other features that, so that was the one aspect that was a great plus and then some of the concerns that we had on my notes here. Um, there was a big dip in some of the aspects for the trust and, leader and senior leadership. We talked about that I believe the leaders of the college are honest and trustworthy. That actually dipped 10%, 10.7%. I trust the senior leaders to the lead the college to future success. That went down 5.7% from 2017. And then I trust senior leadership and the team of the college to set the right course, and that went down 7.5%. So there was just a lot of discussion around um, these big gaps and just to see the longitudinal study of how, how long have we been seeing this arc. Um, I know in the HLC report, when I was looking stuff up in the 2017, um, it states that there was a reason they started this whole survey uh, was in response to the HLC um, peer review feedback form in 2012. Um, and so in 2012, I was able to get that information, and it showed um, there were some gaps in when the data was presented. So there was, um, the HLC identified a significant decrease in its mean cumulative score from 3.9, uh, I'm sorry, 3.93 in 2003 to 3.37. So there was a 15% drop from that time, but then we had quite a large gap until we started this um, HLC report that asked to do this um, new engagement survey. So a lot of the discussion was around how, what do we do with this information? How do we build an action plan? And as you can see in the board packet, there is a list on page two of the dates that the staff um, administration has set up some follow-up sessions. It was uh, nice to be able to know that there's ha they're happening two times a month 
to be able to discuss. We also talked about the importance of not just management talking to employees, but management against management and be able to have that discussion internally about middle management and senior management. But then also to kind of define who is classified as senior leadership. Are trustees considered senior leadership? And if so, what are some of these numbers and how does that reflect our responsibility and our role with our employees here at the college? Um, so that was some of the questions and things that had happened in there. Um, before I move on to the 2% recommendation, I just want to open it up because I know Trustee Musil had questions there too well, as well. I think that the, the engagement survey has been a great tool that we started in 15 and we've had now data from 17 and 19. Mm -hmm. It is not a long longitudinal survey. Um, you highlighted some things that staff had highlighted in, in their PowerPoint to, to present. There's a lot more data in there than that and there's a lot of work that managers, I think Karen Martley, our vice president, went through a lot of examples of what she does within her team uh, to take that information back and to make sure employees are empowered with it. Um, and that's where we'll really see the difference in this, I think, is individual managers doing that. But it's a good, it's a good tool to uh, see areas that we can improve upon. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the importance of making sure that we follow through this process on evaluating how effective this action plan was. Um, with benchmarks, targets, metrics, those things are important, as what was cited in the HLC as things that they would like us to um, boost up a bit. So I'm excited to get more updates. Yep. Uh, I think I requested quarterly updates through this process, so it'd be nice, I think August is the time when most of these follow-up sessions, so that would be nice to, and we've already discussed that. So. The next uh, item that we discussed was the 2% um, increase in pay ranges for all exempt and non-exempt staff positions, um, specifically in the IS department. Um, so I know, um, Becky, would you like to just speak a bit about this? Right. The 2% increase is actually to the salary ranges. Right. So um, the IS department was the only department that we looked at salary and hourly, so this doesn't really impact the IS department. Mm -hmm. The ranges just go for all of the positions within their ranges. So it doesn't impact any employees. All employees that were on staff June 30th will get the 3% increase that the board voted on in February. This is strictly for the pay ranges for the positions. So it's not 5%, right? No, absolutely no. not. That's why I want to make sure. Um, and with that, I'd like to um, move. Um, oh, actually, I'm sorry, I have one question for Tom Pagano. Um, do you feel that this 2% is enough for, to be market competitive? I know Garmin's expanding in Sprint and T-Mobile, and there's a lot of tech-savvy jobs out here. Um, do you feel this 2% pay range is enough to attract the employees we need? Um, then I move the recommendation. Uh, it is the recommendation of the College Administration that the Board of Trustees authorize effectively July 1st, 2019, a 2% increase to pay ranges for all exempt and non-exempt staff positions as of July 1st in 2019. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? No. Any discussion? No. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Trustee Lawson, anything else? Um, that pretty much sums up um, the HR report, unless Trustee Musil had anything else to add. Thank you. We're complete. Is it appropriate to ask a question on the report? Sure, sure. Um, I was curious at, at your meeting uh, with regard to the statistics, particularly those that, that express some sort of dissatisfaction internally. Have we, consistent with that, seen an uptick in non-retirement separations from the college? We have not. Uh, our, our turnover rate is extremely low. And also, have we had challenges recruiting employees? We have not. Um, our, our recruiting, we always have an abundance of applicants to all, most all, almost all of our positions. We have a few unique positions that are hard to fill, but our general positions, we don't have. Okay, thank you. Good questions. Thank you very much. Um, learning quality, Trustee Snyder. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Learning Quality Committee met on Monday, June 3rd at 8.30 in this room. Uh, minutes of the meeting are in the packet. The highlight of the meeting was an update on the Pathways Initiative. Dr. McLeod presented the working agenda for the 2019-2020 fiscal year. The working agenda is the same or, or at least substantially similar as the last working agenda. 
And as such, I have a recommendation to that effect. It is the recommendation of the Learning Quality Committee that the Board of Trustees approve the 2019-2020 <coughs> Learning Quality Committee working agenda as shown in the board packet. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. That concludes my report. Thank you very much. Uh, management, Trustee Ingram. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The management committee met at 8 a.m. on Wednesday, June 5th. The information related to the management meeting begins on page 7 and runs through page 31 of the board packet. The management committee received several presentations from staff. Rachel Lears, Associate Vice President, Financial Services, Chief Financial Officer, reported the Board of Trustees approved the college's 2019-2020 management budget at their meeting on May 16, 2019. The approved budget has been loaded into the college's accounting system in order to facilitate procurement of goods and services for the coming fiscal year. Janelle Vogler, Associate Vice President for Business Services, provided an overview of the disposition of surplus property. She then presented the single source purchase report and the summary of contract renewals found on page 19 of the board packet. <coughs> Ms. Vogler also provided the summary of awarded bids between $50,000 and $150,000. The summary can be found on page 20. In Mr. Hayes' absence, Mr. Jeff Allen, Director of Campus Services and Energy Management, presented an overview of the capital infrastructure inventory and replacement plan. The plan is updated annually and helps guide the allocation of resources for preventative maintenance and preservation of building infrastructure. He then gave a monthly update on capital projects, and this report is on page 28 of the packet. Barbara Larson, Executive Vice President, Finance and Administrative Services, presented a report summarizing the budgets and expenditures to date for the various projects associated with the facilities master plan. That report is in your packet on page 29. We do have a rather large number of recommendations to present this evening. The first recommendation has to do with designating official newspapers for the college. Ms. Allie Scott, account planning coordinator, stated that the Kansas statute requires that when a school district or a community college publishes a legal notice in the newspaper, the newspaper must be one that is published at least weekly, 50 times a year in the college's district. It is the recommendation of the management committee that the Board of Trustees accepts the recommendation of the college administration to designate the legal record and Tri-County News as official newspapers of the college and that publication constitutes legal notice on behalf of the Board of Trustees, and I will make that motion. Is there a second? We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any discussion? That was, there we go. And that motion says that the legal record and Tri-County News as official newspapers of the college. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Ms. Scott also reported that each year the college sponsors selected events that help the college maintain strong community relationships. The organizations are listed on page 7 through 8 of the board packet. It is the recommendation of the management committee that the board accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the listed sponsorships for the 2019-2020 fiscal year at a cost of $16,000 plus an additional $2,000 contingency for a total cost of $18,000, and I will make that motion. We have a motion second. and a second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Ms. Lears reported that the administrative staff conducted a request for proposal RFP for Bond Council Services. The Bond Council assists staff in the preparation and the publication of resolutions, certificates, leases, agreements, and other legal documents related to debt financing. Fees for serving as bond counsel are payable only upon the performance of services with no annual retainer. It is the recommendation of the management committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the proposal from Gilmore and Bell PC for bond counsel services for fiscal year 20 base year and for optional renewal years per the supplemental rates and again, I will make that motion. We second. have a motion, and we have a second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion <coughs> carries. Ms. Lear stated that the administrative staff conducted a request for proposal, RFP, for financial advisor. The college's financial advisor assists the staff in reviewing and recommending financial plans for new capital needs, as well as provides monitoring of any outstanding transactions to determine if restructuring opportunities exist. They also assist the college in obtaining new 
or maintaining existing bond ratings, handling matters related to the public sale of new bond issues, and assist in compiling information to meet appropriate continuing disclosure requirements. Fees for serving as financial advisor are payable only upon the closing of financial transactions. It is the recommendation of the Management Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the proposal from Piper Jaffray Companies for financial advisor services for a fiscal year 20, fiscal year 20 base year and four optional renewal years per the supplemental rates. And again, I will make that motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Trustee I, I would just like to thank the administration and staff and our financial advisor and bond counsel, I'm going to lump these together for going through this review periodically to make sure that our professional services, I think not only does it allow us to have some competition, but it keeps our professional service providers on their toes. And uh, I, I'm not surprised that we selected the incumbents, but I, I think we, we indicated that they are not only professionally qualified, but competitively priced. So thank you, Dr. Subject. Trustee Lundstrom. I would echo uh, Trustee Musil's comment on that, but I would also uh, credit Trustee Musil for initiating that process in the beginning. Okay. That's Any true. other comments? No. Continue. <clears throat> uh, the Management Committee has reviewed the recommended changes to both the reimbursement of travel expenses policy, which was reported by... Did we vote? We we vote? No, we didn't. I guess we didn't. I failed to vote. Sorry. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, they look terrible. Reimbursement. The, um, the management committee has reviewed the recommended changes to both the reimbursement of travel expenses policy, which was reported by Rachel Lears, and the disposition of surplus property policy that Janelle Vogler presented. The updated policies can be found in the board packet on pages 16 through 17. It is the recommendation of the Management Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the reimbursement of travel expenses policy 216.01 and the modifications to the disposition of surplus property policy 215.07 as shown subsequently in the Board Packet, and I will make that motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Trustee Lawson. Um, the value of changing 25000 to 50000 is... $50,000 is a lot of money. It's most, it's more than most vehicles. A significant portion of that could be computer equipment, potentially high-end equipment. Because the way this is now looking to be changed as a recommendation, they're assigning trash or donations. Um, I'm okay lifting, you know, that twenty-five to 50000 for trade-ins or, or sold. Uh, for making things quick and in the process, I understand that. But lifting that value on donations or what could be assigned as trash to me is, is a little rich. So I think 50,000 is a, is a pretty high number for trash and donation. I don't know if the board would be open to a friendly amendment that the items above 25,000 cannot be donated or tra assigned to trash without reaching the board. If they are turned in for trade-in or sold, and then the value can line and go to 50000 that's fine. Um, but I think those two specific things, just to change the trash and donation to 25000 I'll defer to the Management Committee. Was that an issue of discussion or a point of? No, and I'm not. What we're saying is we would report things to the board that are sold for over $50,000. I'm not sure that. So there's not anything in here that says trash or donated for 50000 so if there's a value of something that was 50000 that is labeled trash or donated, it does not have to come to the board? I don't, I don't see that. I'm not sure I'm understanding. I see your five points where you're referring to trash, but I don't right. see that there's a no, value. That's an order. Right. It says okay. trash, right. no. donation to uh, a nonprofit, and it's saying that it's changing the value from 25. It's strike 25 out and put 50. But that change simply changes whether the president has to report it to the right, management that committee. It doesn't, we report it and to it's a sale, so it's not going to be trash because right. it's going to be a sale. Right. But, so well, I read it anyway. trash. I don't know how tr is trash is sold. I don't know. Yeah. I don't Do you like to clarify that? Yes. Um, <laughs> the intention here is, if something had a value of anything, we we would go through this process and we would trade it in, sell it by public sale 
or um, we would only donate as a last resort. So we would never have an item that would be worth 25,000 or more or 50,000 that we would trash or donate. Right. So the, the threshold here is if we're going to sell an item um, that has, that we're going to receive more than 25 before that we raise to 50. And the 50 was selected to make it consistent with our procurement policies, if you're wondering where the 50 came from. So I'm not sure if we, we need to um, change the wording to make that clear, but we, we, the intention would be just for sale. Does that make sense? Trustee Lynch. I, I didn't see that ambig ambiguity, but if, 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 Trustee Lawson sees that in the I wouldn't have a problem cleaning up the language a little bit and having yeah. the same premise. That wouldn't bother me, mm -hmm. but I, I didn't see it that way. <clears throat> Trustee Musil. And I'm not on management, but the, the, the policy says that the executive vice president or designee shall use best efforts to maximize value. Correct. So we haven't changed that Correct. except in wording at all. So that the obligation of staff is to maximize the value of any surplus property. Yes. And then, in the old days, if you sold it for more than twenty-five thousand, the president reported to the management committee. Under the new language, if you sell it for more than fifty thousand, consistent with our our other procurement policies, it would be reported to the management committee. Correct. I'm trying to remember the last time I remember surplus property over twenty-five thousand being reported remember. to the right, yeah. management yeah. committee because I don't think we have very much that no, we don't. use it yeah, we don't. to death almost I mean, sometimes we again sometimes so, we trade in items as we're purchasing new we certainly look to use gov deals or other means of selling mm -hmm. um, donation to educational institutions or nonprofits recycling and we work very closely with sustainability to successfully recycle items and the last and uh, least uh, least desirable res resort is to to throw something out. And the change in Paul, we're not throwing away stuff that's worth 25,000 no. now, so we wouldn't be throwing away stuff that's worth 50,000 with no. the change. No. That's only in the event of a sale. That's right. So if we haven't received many items over 25,000, why would we change it to 50, I guess? I, I, just to make it consistent with your procurement yeah. thresholds. You know, what are, what's an example of some of the things that end up being surplus that we try to, to move on? Um, a good, well, a good a recent example um, is as we moved into the new buildings, we had some automotive lifts that did not, automotive they were lifts. replaced in the new building. So we had, I believe, six of them. One of them was reused in our own automotive area, and we did recently sell um, five of those, the sales in process. And um, so this is interesting that th we were doing this at the same time, and we did sell those for 30000 So we were bringing, I'm going to bring that to management committee next month because of the timing of all of this. So we... Um, contacted vendors that we knew would be interested and they um, all bid on it and we, that was the highest bid. And additionally, things like office furniture. Oh, yes. And what, what happens to all that? So uh, if, we, if we can sell it, um, our uh, warehouse staff know what will sell on GovDeals and what won't. Um, much of the older office furniture um, used to, in years past, end up in the trash, which is not something that we want. Um, our sustainability folks work really hard and find places to donate most of that. So office furniture, um, Computer equipment does not go through GovDeals. It goes to a special um, surplus exchange that wipes it and takes all the data off, and they, they buy it from us. And all this stuff gets stored where? Over in our warehouse. Yeah, have all the members of the board been to the warehouse? We, maybe we should have our next meeting in the warehouse. <laughs> um, we can arrange a, that. I think you should. Yeah, see, we can yeah. absolutely arrange that. Yeah. It's kind of overwhelming, actually. So, yeah. Does it okay. Have yeah. okay. Trustee Lawson, are you uh, satisfied with what's been said? Um, I'm still reading it the same way, but we can continue. Okay, so we're trying to be consistent with other procedures and, uh, okay. Any other discussion? All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Dr. Anton's back there. I, your group, the sustainability group, have played a major role in doing the, the right thing with all of our surplus. So I just wanted to credit that. Right. And Michael Ray is here. Michael Ray, yeah. And we're trying, and we're working with the procurement now to figure out ways to get more nonprofits uh, on a list where we can make them aware of the items that are going to be donated. Yeah, that's great. Trustee Ingram, continue. Hey, there were six <clears throat> recommendations based on RFPs and bids that Ms. Bugler reported. First was a recommendation for an RFP for renewal of annual contract for network infrastructure equipment and services. It is the recommendation of the management committee 
that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the renewal of the contract JCCC-1266 <coughs> with the total not to exceed $965,000 for the remaining renewal through June 30th, 2020. And I will make that motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Trustee Lawson. Is that including the CW government network infrastructure equipment? If I remember correctly, that's the next recommendation or am I? I'm sorry? The network infrastructure equipment services? It sounds like you were reading something else. It is the, it, it is the CDW government. Okay that's, okay, that's what I wanted to make sure. I do have questions for Tom Paragano. Um, I know the technology is changing very fast. Um, and we can either be in the middle of the road, in the road with, you know, middle technology like my Apple computer is um, i5, right, in the Intel, and there's the i3. So, but there's also the pro version of i7. So I can keep buying the i5 version, and the, it will be continued to be faster and newer, but it's still middle of the lane. Is this change from Data Link Corp to CDW? Still staying in the same lane, or are we upgrading with that change? It's just a, a different of, of the same product. Same product. Okay. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Any other discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next is an RFP for the annual financial audit services. It is the recommendation of the management committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve an annual contract for financial audit services with Reuben Brown, LLP, for the JCCC current year amount of $69,120 and $219,140 for the remaining three option years for a total estimated total expenditure of $288,260, and I will make that motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Well, I, I think it's important, especially given the comments on the last, the last item. Most of these are five-year contracts. This audit one is a brand new five-year rolling contract. We can reduce, we can eliminate it after a year if we want. The CDW contract was the fifth year of a five-year contract. So on a lot of these, although we're approving them now, they, they are year-to-year -year contracts, and they may be in the first year, the third year, or the, right. or the fifth year. Um, so I think it's important for the public okay. to know that, that Tom, you will, next year we'll be going out to see if there's somebody else that will resell this technology or in, in, a, in a better, faster way that doesn't cause users to curse. All right. thank, thank you. Any other discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. The RFP for one card transaction system to support cash credit card purchases along with closed loop account purchases was next. It is the recommendation of the management committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the renewal of the contract JCCC-589 with a total not to exceed $71,779.90 for the renewal through June 30th, 2020 and $215,338.95 for the remaining three option years for an estimated total expenditure of $287,118.85. And I will make that motion. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next is the RFP for solar photovoltaic design and installation on two additional building rooftops at the college. With this board action, the college will be adding 650 kilowatts and more than doubling its current solar capacity. It is the recommendation of the management committee that the board of trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the proposal from Artisan Solar for a total expenditure not to exceed $884,000 for the design and installation of a rooftop solar photovoltaic PV system to be in, installed on the roof of the Industrial Training Center and Campus Services Building. And I will make that motion. We have a motion. Is there a second? Trustee Musil seconds. I have a question, and Jake can probably, I know usually we, with our lights and with our HVAC, we've always gotten a payback mm -hmm. kind of idea of how long it would take to pay this back. Do we have that on about these? 11. About 11 years? Mm -hmm. For a system that should last with diminished capacity toward the end of its life cycle 
Uh, 25, 30 years. Okay. So 11 year payback on a system that'll last 25 to 30 years. Correct. Thank trustee you. Trustee Snyder, then Trustee Lawson. Yes, I would just note at least 30 years. Um, so, so two interesting points about this. One, um, Michael Ray, the, the bidding for this was very competitive. And, and Michael Ray explained in our committee that the, the winning bid, one of the things that gave them extra points in the, in the bidding scenario was that they're going to allow several students to, to participate in the installation. So I just think that, that's something to, that's noteworthy. And then also with the addition of the 650 KW, uh, to the best of my knowledge, that will, will make us the, the largest uh, solar host in Kansas. Uh, the, IKEA has the biggest roof that currently has solar on it, and, and this wouldn't wouldn't match that. But in total, the the over 1,100 kW would would make us the, the biggest in Kansas, to the best of my knowledge. And Jay, feel free to. Uh, I think that's right. But I need and to so know. that's that's number one, something cool, but something we should try to highlight publicly. We're the sunniest. And, and I know we have intentions to continue to add to this. Trustee Lawson, information. Oh, I'm very supportive of small business owners. So clearly, when I was researching this company, um, is is it three people own the company? Yeah. Mike. Yeah. Um, I'm not the secretary. Okay. Mostly the one we're working with, uh, Kirk, and then um, we pretty much had them also do work on campus, not directly, but through Jay Dunn for the um, CTE building. Okay, and then was there, because I know this company's in Missouri, so Trustee Snyder just mentioned one of the factors of why this was the pick. Um, was there any other reasons why they were the pick? One of which was the fact that they, they did have a very competitive bid along with their service and their experience um, with the three folks that bedded this, Rex Hayes and I and Jeff Allen, both kind of came to in the conclusion through the procurement matrix that it was really the best fit for us. And then my last question is, does this, because the company is smaller, does that mean that they subcontract out a lot of the work or is yeah. this? They okay. will not be subcontracted. That was part of the interviewing process and one of the things that we like to, to look at as well, uh, they won't be subcontracting. Trustee Musil. Well, given the given the discussion, I think it's important to note that the the bid is 800 or the recommended bid is 884,000. The second place bid is $6,500 less than that. So it is a small percentage difference, which then we rely on procurement to use its matrix to figure out uh, a, a lowest and best bid. So, but there, as Trustee uh, Snyder pointed out, there are eight bids and they're all in a very narrow window. So it was competitive bidding with probably based on similar technology. Dr. Sopcich. Um, Dr. Antle, we're doing all this talk about solar. What does it mean, though, to us with regards to energy conservation or expense, usage? I know you can answer all those. Uh, well, at this point, as usual, Trustee Musil is wondering what's about to happen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I know what's going to happen. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so I'll make it short. So we have a branded uh, program called Power Switch by which we have tried to reduce the amount of energy we use on campus, thus making it easier for us then to transition to renewable energy because we're using, using less energy. Along the way, of course, we managed to, to save almost $3 million in terms of electric costs for, for the college. So all these are all part of a cohesive package. And to, and, and to meet your goal of being 100% uh, sustainable by 2030. And uh, thank you, sir, for remembering that. Yeah. Right. And uh, between what we're doing with solar and what we're doing with our deal with Kansas City Power and Light, we are going to get there very quickly in ways that almost no one in Kansas will. I think the other thing, I appreciate your comments, Trustee Snyder, in terms of this, the size and how important that is. Uh, our new career in tech ed building will have solar panels on it, and we expect that there will be a pretty nice solar energy curriculum program ongoing to help support the student uh, opportunities for work. Thank you. Well, we have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next was RFP for the annual contract to print continuing education catalogs, mailings, and mail list management services. It is the recommendation of the Management Committee 
that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the proposal from Allen Press, Inc. for the Continuing Education Catalog Printing, Mailing, and Mail List Management Services for July 1, 2019 through June 30, 2020 base year of $306,729.75 and a total expenditure not to exceed $1,533,648.75 for the renewal, excuse me, optional renewals through 2024, and I will make that motion. We have a motion, is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> motion carries. Our final recommendation is for pavement improvements to the fire access drive between the Carlson Center and Nerman Museum. It is the recommendation of the management committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the low bid from Gunter Construction in the amount of $169,025.80 with an additional 10% contingency of $16,903 to allow for possible unforeseen costs for a total expenditure not to exceed $185,928.80. And I will make that motion. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Trustee Lawson. Was this a difficult bid to get? Because redoing a fire access seems like a lot of back and forth with permits. So I'm just curious if there was if this was a difficult bid. We only received the, the two bidders. Um, this was something that was um, recommended by the city of Oakland Park that this be a paved fire route. So we need to need to go ahead with it. And this was an opportunity to, to accomplish this during the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. I assume it's a small project, and that's why you didn't get a lot of bidders in a very intense construction season. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Before you continue with your report, I, I, I just want to say to the public and those in attendance tonight, we, we've just authorized the expenditure of a lot of money for the college. And I would uh, re remind us and review that the management committee spends a lot of time with the staff uh, going through these bids. We have a whole bidding process, and that bidding team, the RFP team, uh, spends a lot of time analyzing these. And so while it may seem like, well, they didn't spend a lot of time talking about that uh, issue, uh, that discussion has taken place in committee work in the management. So Trustee Ingram and others on the committee, thank you for the uh, time you put in and staff for going through the detail of this. It is, it is a lot of money, but it has gone through a pretty serious analysis. Trustee Lindstrom. Uh, Mr. Chairman, also, the public is invited to our management meetings on, on, on first month, uh, is it Wednesday? First Wednesday. Wednesday, yeah. Okay. Continue. Um, I just have a final <clears throat> comment, um, actually, if I may. Um, I recently attended the Kansas Association of Community College Trustees meeting where concerns of fraud and practices to prevent that were brought up. Um, fraud is also discussed in our quarterly audit committee meetings, um, and we will meet again in August. Although I believe that our internal and external auditing uh, is an excellent position, I would make the request either from management or from audit that we do have an update um, at, at either of those meetings. So if you would do that, yeah. thank you. Very good. And that does <coughs> conclude my report. Thank, thank you, you, Trustee Ingram. President's recommendations for action, a treasurer's report, Trustee Musil. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the treasurer's report is found on page 32 through page 43 of the board's uh, packet. This uh, month's report is for the year, or the month ended April 30th, 2019. Uh, page one of the treasurer's report is the general post-secondary technical education fund summary, our primary fund. April was the 10th month of the college's 2018-2019 fiscal year, which will end on June 30th. Uh, the unencumbered cash balance as of April 30 was $99.5 million, about $10 million lower than at the same time last year. All of the expenditures in the primary operating funds are within the approved budgetary limits. Um, and with that, it's a recommendation of the college administration that the board approve the treasurer's report for the month ended April 30th, 2019, subject to audit, and I would so move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, advisory committees, Dr. Sopcich. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Um, as, of course, everyone knows, 
that we have advisory committees on campus. These advisory committees do the, the hard work of working with faculty, faculty in our career and tech programs, making sure that what we teach is, is up to speed, that it's current and relevant. Um, tonight, the, the role of the board is to approve these advisory committees. The members of those committees, as well as their addresses, are all listed in Supplement B. Um, it's quite an impressive array. These are all volunteers who play a major role in our college. So I'd like to do the recommendation. Um, it is the recommendation of the college administration that the Board of Trustees approve the advisory committees contained in Supplement B from July 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2020. We have a motion. Is there a second? I don't believe he can make the motion. Well, uh, I'll entertain a motion. I will move. So move. And thank you. And second. Is, and seconded by Lynch from any discussion. Trustee Lawson. Uh, I do have a question because in the 2017 HLC report, it noted multiple places that it's unclear how these groups were built and how they were how they interact. We don't have any benchmarks or real reports of what these advisory groups are providing. So my question is, can we put into place a process to expand the diversity of the members of these advisory committees? At minimum, we should look to see if there's ways to minimize um, some advisory committees where one company holds multiple seats to diversify the viewpoint that we receive. So I think that could be helpful in providing answers to HLC next time. That's a great idea. I think that's on target, something that we always work toward. And um, I'm sure the, the faculty and staff who oversee these advisory committees can work in that direction. Good. Yeah. Thank you. I, I might recommend, I, I talked to Dr. McLeod about this while I was on learning quality about an explanation of how the, the uh, advisory committees work, how they're selected, how often they meet, how the faculty of those areas use them. Um, he and Dr. Singh try to attend all of those advisory committee meetings. And so I, I think the process is in place. It may simply be that we need a, a reporting process to the board uh, at a retreat or otherwise about how those things are used because I had the same questions Trustee Lawson had. So I reached out to Dr. McLeod and he uh, explained them very well to me, at least to my satisfaction. But the rest of the board may need to hear that as well. Yeah, well, I think the HLC report states on page four, 18 to 46, quote, it's unclear how these advisory groups process uh, was to review programs, evaluate, and inform the college's general education outcome process. Another quote, no mention of the benchmarks for performance or specific sets of targets for advisory groups. There's a few more quotes, so I think it's important since HLC is our accreditation process that if they're not saying this, this is something that we need to be able to come back to them. What HLC is actually after um, is effectively an explanation, <coughs> but one that we actually have in place. What we do not have um, is a written document that details that. But all of those benchmarks are in place. All of those um, checkpoints in terms of who serves, um, terms for service, which differ between programs, those things are in place. What we do not have is we do not have them written into a single document. And so that's something we can't accomplish. I appreciate that. Thank and, and I think greater scrutiny by the board on the effectiveness of the advisory committees are what they um, contributing being taken seriously by the faculty. I think that's a terrific idea. And so I'm sure Dr. McLeod will be, will be all over that one. Trustee Ingram. The other thing I wanted to add to that, I think it's a really good idea, Trustee Lawson, that, um, that you've made that recommendation, because I'm sure that there are some of us who sit on advisory committees of other organizations throughout the community, and we, we want to make sure that what we are sharing is valued too. So I think it's a really good idea for both in terms of collaboration and work across our community. So thank you. Monthly report to the board. Sure, before you, you've see, you have the um, report. As always, it's excellent. Did we vote on the advisory committees? No. I don't think so. I don't think we did. All in favor Maybe. signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Monthly report. Um, the um, report to the board uh, you have before you, it chronicles a wonderful array of activities um, and involvement by members of our faculty and staff all working toward the same thing and that's uh, student success. Uh, tonight we're going to do a lightning round. And um, Karen, I'd like to ask you to go first. Sure. Um, we're kind of closing out our fiscal year, so we have a number of people that are involved in various leadership cohorts and organizations, like we've just done our nominations for our KCCLI again. And um, one that I wanted to really highlight is 
Um, we had five people participate in leader, chamber leadership programs this past year, which is great because those, those cohorts come to campus and a number of people then speak to them and we give them tours. Um, tomorrow at the Overland Park graduation, Jeff Hoyer, who participated, was our representative, was elected by his class to be the speaker of his class. So he's going to be the speaker tomorrow. So when you see Jeff, congratulate him on that. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to share, which was something kind of unique that um, happened towards the um, uh, in the middle of the graduation process, we worked jointly with um, Kate and the foundation and workforce partnership, um, faculty, um, Janice Blancet's area, but we had uh, students that were going through GED program and the ESL program. And one of the things we want to do is get them a work credential at the same time. So they went through a welding credential as well as getting an OSHA credential. Um, they also made a smoker, which they donated to the um, culinary program here on campus as well, too, so you can see some of their fine work. But um, I just want to share that as a unique example of some things that we're doing to help um, place people into the workplace and get them good paying jobs where we have these gaps that we're, um, we're really trying to fill a lot of jobs with the low unemployment rate. So that was a unique thing. Burlington was also involved and um, very helpful in that process too. So that's very important. And Karen, I was pleased in the, uh, and Chris, I'm probably gonna get the title wrong, but the uh, recent newsletter that went out electronically of the young man that took the CDL course and now started his own fleet. That was yes. pretty cool. Yes. Thank you. Yes. That's great. Dr. Weber. Okay, I want to talk about enrollment if I can. Uh, in the spirit of lightning, though, I have no presentation, no handout, so bear with me in my numbers. Thank you um, for adhering we, to the yeah, spirit of lightning. <laughs> We've talked a little bit uh, historically about the decline in enrollment and its impact, so I wanted to give a little bit of comparison, but then I wanted to frame um, enrollment around really our focus on access and student success, and that, you know, I, I've, I, I talk about this nationally, and I was in a meeting yesterday, and we were talking about how are we gonna prepare uh, schools who are essentially east of the Rockies and not Texas for this declining enrollment that's gonna come for the next couple of decades. Um, but so we're, we're not immune to that. But I, so I've got some numbers here from National Student Clearinghouse as a comparison. They have three years worth of data. They're kind of the, the utmost numbers of, of, of enrollment data across the country. So two-year colleges, which we're a sector of, over the last three years have been down to 10.2%, whereas we're down 3.8. So yes, we've been down over the last three years, but we're down just over a third of what the rest of community colleges across the country are. Um, our largest loss has been in, in our 24 plus, our adult students because of workforce and, and, and workforce training programs in community colleges. Um, the rest of the country in community colleges is down 12.3%, we're down 11.2%. That's where we're about balanced. So when you see that 10.2 to 3.8 overall, where that gap is, it's because we're up in 18 to 23. We're up in high school age. Uh, we've done a lot of work to, to, to do that and to mitigate that loss, provide a little more perspective here even locally. We've talked a little bit about being down this summer, so we're down about 4.4% this summer uh, headcount, but I can tell you that MCC and KCK are both down over 5%. And so it's, re it's really regional and workforce and kind of weathering this, this, this enrollment storm that's going on. So those are the numbers, but I want to spend a little more time talking about some of the access and success because amidst those numbers are some really powerful things that we've done. Uh, I've shared with you before the removing barriers work that we've done, which is really kind of focusing on helping students, um, their experiences at JCCC better uh, dictate their successes here versus maybe prior experiences at other institutions and baggage they bring. Our uh, strategic enrollment team has had some highlights over the last number of years. Um, this fall, our Hispanic student population reached a high of 1,777. So despite our enrollment dip over the last number of years, we've increased our Hispanic students by 38.5% in the last five years. Um, a lot of work has, has gone into that strategic enrollment. Our first time in college is flat. Our high school students, as we talk about regularly, are up 13 and a half percent. The decision the board made a couple years ago, three years ago, was a courageous decision to uh, implement a metro rate. We're up over 25 percent with metro rate population in three years. Um, that's that that was something that's really helped with uh, us reaching the region, and, and it helps a little bit with our our diversity numbers as well. And an upcoming initiative that we're doing that we're really excited about 
is called Success Opportunity Semester. And what we're doing is we're taking students who has, have historically been put on, a, on academic suspension because they, they failed their, their probation semester. And what we've done is we told them you can't come back for a while and their probation was pretty loose as far as the support they got. And we're saying, well, you can come back conditionally. You need to take this course. You need to meet, it's a learning strategies course. You need to meet with a counselor. So if you'll, if you'll be willing to, to maintain your enrollment, but take advantage of our wraparound support opportunities, we'll let you continue enrollment. So uh, our team's really excited. That was an organic thing that came up from a number of departments across the country, or excuse me, across the, 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 the college. So those are access things that we've worked on. And then real swiftly, I just wanted to highlight a couple of success initiatives because despite our declining enrollment, uh, and you hear me talk a lot uh, when we give the pathways updates about the, the successes in the pathways cohorts, but we don't really get to talk about grad rate because we just finished our three-year cohort. Um, but our college's graduation rate for IPEVs, which is what we use for national comparison data, um, has increased by over 50% in the last three years. We, 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 we had graduation rates that were 14, 15, 16% um, for three years prior, and those are normal. The national average is about 15%, even a little high. Um, our graduation rates have the last three years been 23, 22, and 24%. Uh, for, for a college in a state that does not value uh, graduation upon transfer, as some states do. The, the work that our teams have done across the college and it's truly been a collaborative effort uh, are, is to be commended. So our graduation rate growth has been really good. And then the last thing is the amount of students receiving awards. Uh, you know, again, we, we, we decreased in enrollment uh, the, this past year, but we had 77 more students earn degrees or certificates than years prior. Last year we had 2,985. This year we had over 3,000. We had 3,062 students earn an award, and we awarded 153 additional degrees and certificates. So, just I, I, I say that because oftentimes we look from a revenue standpoint or who's taking advantage of an educational opportunity standpoint, and we get concerned about enrollment. And we don't always take time to to recognize that those who are taking advantage of it are succeeding at a higher rate than we have here in, in significant amount of years. Randy, if I could, um, take 60 seconds and explain when you said the state doesn't value transfer of graduation rate. Speak to what exactly that means. Yeah, so in, in Kansas what happens is we have what we, we, we call it statewide articulation, but really first when a student graduates from Johnson County Community College, his or her courses are uh, evaluated at a course level by the program at the a transfer institution. There are states that say when you have your associate's degree, you will no longer take freshman, sophomore level courses. You've completed your gen eds. Focus on the junior level hours at your institution. Or states like Florida where they have, and California where their universities are so highly enrolled, they say you must get your associates as a transfer student prior to enrolling at the, at the university. So those are, those are statewide initiatives where transfer is valued more, where the completion of a degree is valued more at transfer. Trustee Lawson and Musil. Thank you, Dr. Weber. I mean, the data that you're compiling is uh, a lot of work, so I appreciate you doing the lightning round. I have a question about the, the decrease is 3.8% over three years, but the country was, you said 11? The, the country was 10.2. Okay. Uh, do we know why this is happening? Well, a lot of it is, and we talked a lot about it a little bit before, is community college enrollment is countercyclical with the economy. So most people, particularly adults, non-traditional students, will come to a community college for workforce training, and that's usually when they can't find a job. Um, right now, unemployment is as low as it's been. We've been in the longest recovery uh, from a recession that we've ever had. And so students aren't coming looking for job training. Their jobs are begging them to come with the least amount of qualifications that they've had in, in generations. And so we, we're, we're experiencing that. And that's why I point out our 18 to 23 is still up 1.3%. So we're growing in our traditional age students. Um, our first time in college is growing. It's our adult students that we're just 
that are down because there are so many jobs, which is a, which is a good thing. But we still want to look and say, how can we make sure that, that we're doing career training? And maybe they have jobs, but they don't have family sustaining or, or supporting wages. And, and so there, I think that we still have some work to do in that initiative. But that's why it's consistent across the country is the economy. So I've heard a lot of articles say exactly that. But do we know from our Johnson County residents, have we talked to them specifically about why they are not coming here? I, I think we talked to, to a number. I think one of the hardest things in, in enrollment in college is it's not really a control group. We don't have access to every resident in Johnson County and to, to, complete, to, to complete a survey. There's, there's work out there, and we've talked with IR about doing like non-enrolling student surveys and that, but usually that's somebody who has expressed interest but didn't complete the enrollment process. But somebody who doesn't express interest, um, you just you watch those trends, and that's where trend data provides value is yes, enrollment goes up because there aren't jobs. Um, but I, 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 I guess I'd entertain uh, a way and work with our IR team to try to figure out how to access those individuals. But, but it's, it's hard, it's hard to, to Yeah, to I'd be curious it. to actually know from our residents why there's a, a continual year after year decrease. I just think that should be, that's valuable. Trustee Musil. Well, and IR stands for Institutional Research? That is correct. Thank you. Um, <laughs> my acronym, hate, fear. Um, when you say graduation rates, define that. That is getting your certificate or degree within X amount of time? Within, yeah, so, so the way the graduation rates are defined um, by IPEDS, which is the national um, uh, data set, is 150% of your program. So for a community college, a two-year college, you get three years to do it. At a baccalaureate school, you get six years, so within 150%, which is why when we show our graduate, most recent graduation rate data, and we're going to talk more about this as part of the KPIs for the retreat that we're planning, I think, in August, you would have to take the fall 15 or now the fall 16 cohort, give them three years to graduate in spring of 18, uh, and then you have to throw all that stuff into the National Student Clearinghouse, then you get everybody's report. So we just had our graduates of our fall 16 incoming class, but it's going to take us all fall and into the spring to get it into the system and get comparison data back. Great. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? I would just ask you to speak to the competition for the 18 to 23 year old in our community. It's extremely competitive, yeah. the, the, the competition for 18 to 23. And I would say the, compl the, complete or the competition for adults is competitive too. We made a lot of headway when the, uh, the predatory schools were, were taken out of the market. Um, some administrative changes recently have allowed them a little more into the market. <clears throat> we're seeing some of those closures again, uh, but we're, it's, uh, Every education institution is trying to find a way to get students. We're actually seeing a big part of what we got, and then counting these numbers, historically, we got what we call reverse transfers. A lot of Johnson County students who would go to a university, wasn't the right fit for them, they come home, finish their associates, and then go to a different university. Uh, these schools are working really hard at retaining their students now, so we don't get as many of those reverse transfers because those schools are doing a better job of keeping them there. Thank you. Trustee Lunch. Randy, you mentioned <clears throat> you mentioned the uh, the metro rate. Has there been any any kind of uh, reaction to that from other colleges in the metropolitan area on the Missouri side who have instituted a, a similar program? I, I, not strategic. I think there have been some examples <clears throat> of some programs, and I, I, some dis we've had discussions with some of the other institutions. Um, I, I, it's, I'll tell you. Uh, a big reason we did it is we used to have affiliation agreement where certain students in certain programs were able to get reduced rates for those program, those courses. And it was a very, very hard program to administer and it felt a lot of times like a student, like a gotcha or a bait and switch. And by simplifying the process and saying, if you come over here, doesn't matter what program you're in, doesn't matter what courses you take in a program, this is your rate. It has made it a much simpler process. We have way more students and way, way, way fewer complaints. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> KCK has a metro rate. They do? Sure. It's not that uncommon. And of course, you've seen the border schmorder deal from UMKC in the competition for students. Mm -hmm. I, I can tell you that um, some presidents aren't thrilled with uh, the aggressiveness of our advertising and marketing in those other areas, but I'm sure that contributes to the, to the success we've enjoyed. All right. Thank you, Randy. Dr. McLeod. 
Um, we've had a lot of busy, busy, busy things going on um, in the spring. In the last few weeks, however, things that I'd like to update on, we've had a lot of conversation about saving students money through the utilization of um, OER, and that is Open Educational Resources. The state has taken on an opportunity to create an OER council to look deeper into what we can do as a sector, not just as individual schools. Um, and to wit, we have actually put forward um, one of our faculty members, and today I received notice um, that Barry Bailey, reference librarian, who is the person who heads up our OER council on campus, um, has been seated um, of the 19 community colleges, uh, 10 representatives uh, from community colleges were placed on that council. And um, I, I think that uh, we have shown very well that Barry was able to obtain one of those seats. And so as we move forward over the next several months, that group will be looking at um, a statewide OER initiative involving um, all of the colleges and universities in an attempt to create a database um, of usable uh, information that we'll be able to bring forward for students. Um, we are also in the offing to continue working on our biotechnology program. Um, I spent uh, three days over last weekend um, in Austin uh, with our biotechnology faculty at the Systematic Change Institute looking at how we can better leverage um, what we already had in place and the equipment and facilities that we uh, previously utilized as well as connectivity to other universities to build an infrastructure whereby our biotech program will have better transfer opportunities for students. Uh, the largest issue in the field is that since we uh, have built this program over the last nine years, the field itself has evolved to uh, the AA not being the end goal, uh, but many universities have, have dived into the idea of biotechnology. Um, in such a way that the bachelor's degree has now become um, more so accepted as an upper division degree that allows students not only to get an entry level position but to advance into management. Um, to wit, uh, just yesterday, uh, Fort Hayes um, brought forth a biomechanical engineering degree at the bachelor's level and Kansas State um, also brought forth a bioengineering uh, degree, which we will be looking to articulate with. We've already been working with the University of Kansas, uh, who has inaugurated a biotechnology degree three years ago at the Edwards campus, and we're looking to make sure that more of our credit hours transfer there as well. So the field continues to grow, and we continue to try and stay on the cutting edge by being um, smarter about how our curriculum is designed so that it can transfer into more of these new and emerging degrees so that our students won't be trapped in a position where they have fewer options as the field continues to evolve. That's great. Thank you, Mickey. Um, lastly, as many of you know, at the end of May, we held our major commencements. We have two commencements on Friday. Um, they're, quite the, uh, they're quite the event to pull off. It's an incredible team effort um, across campus to make that work. The campus always looks beautiful. Uh, the logistics are, are wonderful. The inside of the gym is fantastic. I can't come up with enough superlatives um, to describe what goes into that. This year um, was extra special. As many of you know, those that were there, we had to um, conduct an emergency eva evacuation uh, for real. And I, you can't say enough great stuff about our PD, uh, Chief Russell, our emergency preparedness, Alyssa Pacer, uh, just an absolutely wonderful job. That gym was vacated in, it had to be record time. And so I think one of the things we're gonna work on in our facilities master plan is install greater air conditioning in the basement of the gym. But, <laughs> you know, and when, it, when something like that happens, you never know, um, you always have to play it safe and you have to do, and you have to execute. And everyone did a fantastic job. Randy mentioned earlier the growth rate in graduations. Um, that just doesn't happen by coincidence. That is a huge effort on the part of many people across campus. And specifically, you have to credit the hard work of the faculty and our student services and everyone who comes together to work on student success. And so to celebrate that, um, we're gonna a little a snip, and I think that's gonna be on social media, Chris, just to celebrate graduation. So we could run that.
this is a behind the scenes uh, shot of the, of the evacuation itself. So we, <laughs> we had an embedded, em, embedded member of our staff. that together? Really, video services? That's ter terrific. Um, that's what we're all about. Those shots of student success and celebration of their accomplishment here, that's what this college is about and that's why we're here. So thank you all very much. I just wanted to say, Dr. Sobchick, I mean, this 43-page board report that we always get attached to our board packet um, is just something that I, it's always delightful to be able to read. And I don't know if the public has ever had a chance to read this, but it just highlights so much of all the accomplishments, our faculty, our students, our administration. It goes into such detail of specific events that happened, the excitement that was going on around there. Uh, I have not been able to find this online, but is there any way that the public could see this? I mean, this is, this is amazing. Yeah, it's a, it's a great piece. Usually in the neighborhood of anywhere 40 plus or minus pages right. every month. A lot of work goes into that. Um, perhaps the opportunity to feature that uh, we can make happen because it is an incredible chronicle during the course of the year of yeah. what happens here. Right. Board packet is online. But, but not the board packet. No, it's so it shouldn't be. We yeah. agree right, with right, right. That That's much us. more interesting than the board packet. <laughs> hey. Sorry. Great work. Thank you. <laughs> Trustee Musso. I, I just wish Dr. McLeod would explain what OER is and the impact on students. Because when we talk about affordability and accessibility, this is the next huge step that we can take to make this place more affordable. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean if we had an, an open educational resource database statewide or for our college? If we were able to, to finally really leverage a statewide uh, resource for open educational resources, students would no longer um, be beholden to necessarily have to buy textbooks. Um, our instructors would be able to leverage written, published information from the source, from uh, instructors from all of our universities and colleges who've produced that work without the middleman of publishing companies. Uh, in some cases, things like um, science textbooks that, that run us um, $300 to $400 per student, uh, we could mitigate that cost by buying into a database for maybe $40 a student, which would allow that student access to all of those same materials or more um, current materials. Some of, the, some of the technology around OER has allowed um, real-time updating of, of data and information so the students always have cutting edge information as opposed to you know, a, a book that was copyrighted a year ago having information from even the previous year to that, it would be real-time data and information that they could use um, not only to learn but to uh, undergo projects, to talk about infrastructure changes depending on their, um, depending on their subject area of study. Uh, it really would change the dynamic in terms of student affordability largely because of the two things that cost the most money for a student 
Um, it is housing, which we do not worry about as a commuter campus, and textbooks. So the affordability that we provide for our tuition dollars is oftentimes offset by a much higher cost uh, in the text that a student has to purchase to access that information for their classes. So it would be uh, revolutionary for us in terms of what we'd be able to do for affordability. Well, and I know it's not as simple as just technology. It's got to have content from faculty members yep. uh, from around the, the state or the, or the country. But I think it's a, it's a key thing to allowing us for a competitive advantage from cost, from recruiting students, mm -hmm. and from just allowing students to have an opportunity to come here and not spend more on the textbook than they spend on their three-hour tuition costs. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Maricopa in Arizona, they um, use a number, I believe it's $16 million that they save their students through OER. Now that's a huge, that's gigantic huge. school. Yeah, that's a big school. But it's pretty remarkable. Very good, thank you, appreciate it. Uh, I don't believe we have any old business. I don't believe we have any new business. So we'll go to reports from board liaisons, faculty association, Dr. Harvey. Thank you. Uh, sorry I missed last month's meeting. I think I'm going to need extra time tonight to make up for it, but no, I don't know if I will go over. I'll try not to. Um, but I, I first just want to say that what I would have normally said at the May meeting is um, that we had our annual elections, and I am obviously here, so I was reelected. Um, so I'll be serving as the president again for another year. This will be my last year serving as president. I don't intend to run again for a third year. Usually two years is about all the excitement we can stand in this position, but um, I look forward to another year. Jim Liker was, as, will be the vice president again. Terry Easley Geraldo will once again be our secretary. Eve Blobaum is our treasurer. And Brian Wright is our, what we call, Uniserve representative. And then Dennis Arjo serves as our uh, previous past president. So we have the same officer group as last year. And I have to say, it is a dream team of fantastic people with incredible talents. And um, I don't know how I would have done this last year without them. So I'm sure you've heard a lot of those names, and for good reason, because they're all outstanding faculty. Um, I do want to take a moment to comment on one item from the last board meeting, since I wasn't here to comment on it at the time. Um, Trustee Cook was remarking on discussions we've been having surrounding the needs on our campus involving issues of diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. And um, the number of course offerings with elements addressing uh, these and events on campus were mentioned. One thing that stood out to me most in listening back to the board meeting was uh, the discussion of a decline in the number of ethics reports or complaints of discrimination to HR and how efficiently HR was handling ethics complaints. And the point that I wanted to make that I felt was missing from the discussion is that discrimination is very difficult to demonstrate with sufficient evidence. And a lack of cases of reportable discrimination that are actionable offenses is not really where we want to set the bar. Um, many experiences are very difficult to impossible to report because they're really subtle. They're so subtle that the person doing it doesn't realize they're doing it half the time. Um, microaggressions still have a very real impact on a person's ability to thrive and achieve any sort of equality in an organization or institution. And I do feel that this institution still has a lot of work to do. So I look forward to continued conversations on how we can be, do better as an institution. But I did want to point that out because those were just some points made and I just felt absent from that conversation was the reality of all the, those subtle things that are hard to exactly report. So, but still are very real, a very real experience for folks. Okay, so um, I wish I had happy things, like the video of graduation, which I love graduation, that was really good. Uh, what a fun time we had. Uh, but I do need to talk about some, uh, some real talk of some substance on behalf of my colleagues that I represent. Uh, so I would like to discuss the employee engagement survey, survey, sorry, survey that um, Trustee Lawson mentioned uh, in her report from HR. A uh, summary of institution-wide results was posted on our website. And I also did forward that to the board members in case you didn't notice it, just uh, so that you had the same thing that we had to look at. 
Um, I also had, of course, uh, results from my area because my dean shared the ones from my division. So I had very specific ones, which each area got their own, in addition to the college-wide ones. Um, the general takeaway, of course, that we've already talked about was that employees at the college generally love working with their coworkers. And this was consistent with the faculty responses that I saw. We felt inspired by our coworkers and all of those things. Um, and generally, we like our immediate supervisors. Uh, but of course, as we've talked about, senior leadership took a large hit on this survey. And I did want to take a second and just list the, what was in that report, the least favorable survey items, okay? So the questions were, that, that fell under the least favorable items, when the organization makes changes, I understand why. The senior leadership team of the college values people as their most important resource. If I contribute to the college success, I know I will be recognized. The senior leadership team is committed to responding to the results of this survey. I find that one ironic that that's on the lowest one. I know how I fit into the college's future plans. Okay, so those were the least favorable items. So, of course, I'm going to focus for a moment on some of that. Um, so, I know that we have listening sessions that have been set up that are going to include some faculty opportunities in the fall uh, whenever everyone gets back. Um, but from what I've heard in the past, much of the responsibility on the, the issues with this survey results and the concerns, much of that responsibility has been put on immediate supervisors to fix it in the past. And the immediate supervisors are getting pretty good scores. People like their immediate supervisors. Um, so I've had a lot of faculty, I'm just being honest, this is some real talk here today, okay, that are asking how long did the score, how low did the scores need to go before we take it seriously? Like how low, like how low does it have to get? Okay, so um, that's, that's the comments that are being made. So for the purposes of reflecting on these items, I do want to speak to a few glaring examples that, I, that have impacted the faculty in the last year. And I don't want you to get too caught up in my specific examples because I see them more as symptomatic than I do these specific examples, but I do feel like I need to give a few. So I have four, just items that I'm going to mention. Okay, in no particular order. Um, the response that the draft response to the HLC on shared governance was drafted without faculty involvement. And that in itself is a bit ironic. The second one, after a contentious negotiation that resulted in us going to impasse, we had a battle around December and January over a desire to limit the usual number of awards for faculty deserving an award for service and going above and beyond. And to this particular item, I just want to say, let's pick our battles. Is this really the fight that we want to fight with faculty over the number of awards recognizing their contributions? A third example, our faculty chairs are being required to attend 40 hours of new training this summer, in addition to their regular duties that they do, and there's not been any additional compensation for the extra week where there, many of them are off contract. It's just been rolled into, well, you're compensated as a chair, so you're gonna come to this extra 40 hours of, of work. Now, because it's a supplemental contract because it's not their regular contract. I can only, as a union president, I can only advise them that you can choose to not be a chair. Like, I can't do anything about the fact that, that your duties have been changed and you're not being compensated for this. I can only say, like, well, if you guys just decide you won't be chairs, then they can't make you be a chair. But, you know, many of the faculty are not willing to do anything that's going to harm their departments or their programs. They legitimately care what happens, and they're very invested, obviously, in this place. So I just want to throw that one out as another example of there are things the college could do, and the college has the resources that really impact morale. And um, a fourth example that I have that I need to mention is that um, I noticed very recently 
a practice of handpicking faculty to serve on important committees. That's great that we're on the committees, don't get me wrong, but for example, the search committee for the replacement for Vice President Larson's position. Now traditionally, the Faculty Association has been asked to put a representative on a search committee that's this high a level. And this isn't exactly about the Faculty Association and us, but this is about the, it coming from the faculty. Because although I have no problems with the faculty that were hand-selected, the practice of administration hand-picking without allowing faculty to choose the representation, it doesn't really help with concerns about transparency and trust issues, and I'm really hoping that this doesn't reflect a new trend that we're gonna have where certain faculty get picked because we don't mind working with them. They're not so, they don't ask those pesky questions we don't wanna hear or whatever the motivation is. Um, you know, I, I realize that I don't know all the faculty, but I have colleagues that among all of us, we know all of the faculty and we know their talents and they might not be ones that you guys know or see or have met, but the whole idea that a faculty representative is chosen by faculty, there's something to that, that is, it just makes for um, a better sense of trust and transparency. So those are just some ideas of things that really do impact morale, really do impact the faculty's feelings about the upper administration. And I, I hated to give those specific examples because I don't want it to focus in on one particular person or area or part of the upper administration of the college. Uh, but I want it to just show, you know, because I'm faculty, that's kind of how it comes out. I just wanted to show some just examples of, of our symptomatic issues of not value, feeling valued, not feeling valued, and, um, and I think that's what you're seeing, and not having trust, not feeling like there's enough transparency. Um, it's not enough to just tell us what you're gonna do. That's not communication. <laughs> That alone does not count as communication. So, okay, so finally, I wanna end my report with this. Uh, I wanted to take a moment and reflect on the purpose and goals of the Johnson County Community College Faculty Association. I wanted to share this with you. This is from our bylaws, and um, I, I don't know if they've ever been changed. I imagine these were from the beginning, back in the 70s when we first started, but um, our purpose and goals. These are our purpose and goals. Number one, to work for the educational welfare of all students at Johnson County Community College. Number two, to work for the professional and personal welfare of the faculty and staff at Johnson County Community College. Number three, to develop and promote the adoption of such ethical practices, personnel policies, standards of preparation and performance as mark a profession. And number four, there's only six, I'm halfway. To promote and develop a continuing program to improve instruction, to upgrade professional preparation, and to improve working conditions, fringe benefits and salaries through formal negotiations with the Board of Trustees. Number five, to enable members to speak with a common voice on matters pertaining to the teaching profession and to present their individual and common professional interests before the Board of Trustees. And number six, to hold property and funds for the attainment of these purposes. So those are, that's our goals and our purpose. And I just wanna point out that number one has always been about the educational welfare of our students because that is why we're all here. And, and then second, we're interested in the welfare of all the employees at this institution too. So um, although we legally negotiate on behalf of the bargaining unit, we're interested in promoting the welfare of everyone that works here. So that concludes my report. Are there any questions? Trustee Lawson. Hi. There was a lot of stuff in I know, that sorry. report. I don't know if I got it all, but. So I missed last month, so I had to make up for it. <laughs> uh, things that I picked up. Um, so you talked about the shared governance. I know in the HLC that was something that was um, cited on page 10 saying the visiting team recommends working collaboratively with the academics and administration to establish a clear delineation of the role and scope of authority of the various groups and committees and academics as well as establishing communication protocols that facilitate shared governance within the academics 
the interim report that was sent to HLC uh, in 2019, so that was 2016, 2019. The second paragraph says, during the summer of 2018, the chief executive officer wrote a policy statement entitled Shared Governance at JCCC, which was released to faculty at large during a public meeting in August. That doesn't sound like what HLC is asking. So that is something that for me, um, I'm looking at ways to be able to facilitate uh, what you're talking about as far as shared governance. The ethics reporting line was something that also stood out to me because I was ill last month, so I was not able to attend, but I reviewed the, the video and the minutes as well. The speed rate does not equal satisfaction. It's really the person that's coming forward to find out if they are satisfied with the results or the process. And so I think that was something that really stood out for me as far as when we get excited about the number of how quick we get through ethics reporting line, is that really the best measurement of success? Um, the leadership you mentioned, I didn't catch that question on that one, but the cherry picking, uh, like I think you used a different term, but that was my, the way I grabbed it. Um, the, the search committee the, without allowing specific faculty in certain groups, I know uh, one, that was something else that was cited in our HLC, um, page 109 um, of the Systems Appraisal Feedback Report, stating the overwhelming thing that I noticed is, quote, it's unclear how these processes were evaluated or decisions made by the President's Cabinet, but it's unclear how those decisions were made. So there was a lot of comments about very similar things of just not understanding how decisions are made and under, wanting the process. And so I'm just, um, I hear you, and I'm just, I'm taking notes, so thank you. I'm looking forward to our next collegial steering because we did discuss shared governance and collegial steering, and I would say, again, to remind the full board that that's, those are representatives from the Faculty Senate as well as Educational Affairs and the Faculty Association plus administration. Uh, I was, and Nancy and I, uh, Trustee Ingram and I were present with with that shared governance statement. And my sense, uh, Dr. Harvey, was that uh, that was uh, agreed upon in that section. Uh, shared governance is kind of interesting, as well as uh, what I share gets accepted and approved. And uh, if my piece doesn't get accepted or approved, then it's not shared governance. So this uh, communication issue continues and goes on and on. Um, uh, I, I uh, have made, I've made several notes here in terms of the whole engagement survey okay. because I think a piece that we need to look at is what kinds of activities were going on during that evaluation period. And if the waters are calm and nothing is, being, is taking place, then scores tend to be high. We did go through an HLC. We did go through an impasse, as you uh, pro uh, pro properly described. Uh, we've gone through a change in facilities where some people aren't happy about where their lab is going to be. We've gone through discussion about uh, cut scores in a certain department that they're still not happy about what those scores should be. Your point, and I don't want to get into a debate tonight because that's not the intent of this session. That's why I'm looking forward to collegial steering. But I think it was your point number four that said we're really about development and improvement, and yet there is, I think I sense the concern that why should department heads have to go through additional training for 40 hours to be a department head when they've been a department head. So I find that old discussion interesting and I look forward to it. Uh, Trustee Musil, you had a comment. But I just want to point out that having, and I know not everybody sees ethics points reports because it's just, they're just presented to the audit committee. Um, but if you've served on the audit committee, I, and I know that uh, Dr. Cook wasn't suggesting last week and Janelle, when she used to present that in her old position, ethics points reports about how many complaints we have in various areas and how fast they're handled, and we benchmark those against national uh, educational institutions. Nobody's suggesting that's the end all, because I agree with you. There, there are other areas that, that where somebody might not report something. But it's interesting that if we didn't keep that information, we would be accused of not benchmarking ourselves. So we take as much information and as many tools as we can, and then we use those to have a dialogue to figure out what else we need to do uh -huh. to make sure those, those other items on campus, if somebody's uncomfortable reporting anonymous, anonymously through an ethics point about a supervisor or somebody else they feel is harassing them, we, we want that reported. And we've 
taken steps, I know when I was on, on the audit committee as either chair or vice chair, to push out more information so that employees know that that's available. And I, I think Janelle would tell us that there's a trust level among people with ethics points that it is, is anonymous, it is responded to, and I would suggest that not every employee that turns in an ethics point complaint is going to say that I was satisfied with the result because sometimes there might not be enough evidence or they may just, it may just be a supervisor situation. So, um, Can I just clarify? My comments were not um, to say anything about how ethics point is being handled, but just to say the context that it was mentioned in was like, you know, I think we're doing pretty good here because we've got these classes and we've had these events on campus and we haven't had, we've had a decline in ethics reports. And so, so it was the context that it was used in that I'm saying that doesn't tell us about the, the real issues that, that I'm concerned about with diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think my colleagues are concerned about that doesn't speak to those. I mean, I, I would hope that, that we would do all of those things, but that's not, that's not where we leave it. And so that was what I was wanting to say because I just didn't hear that said. I'm not saying that that is not a sentiment shared by the board, but that was not something I heard in the conversation and discussion last time. So I wanted to add that part that that's not where we set the bar as you know how many actionable <laughs> instances of discrimination we've lowered those so we're, and we, we investigate them all so that, because there's so much more to it than that. I think the difficulty that this college has had in the eight years I've been on the board is that we do a lot of things very, very well. And so we tend to focus on those things that we don't do well. And I think that's what we've, we've seen since Dr. Sopcich. You know, we've tried to improve those things. And I'm willing to celebrate Ethics Point at the same time, figuring out ways that we can even be better. But Trust I'm sorry, Trustee Snyder, did you have a comment? Uh, I did, or do. Uh, so, so I've worked for a number of organizations from 50, 100 person organizations up to Fortune 10 companies. Um, so when I saw these results, they, they didn't really jump out to me as a huge problem. Clearly, I think the, the trend is important to take note of and, and we need to make improvements where we can make improvements. But um, it, it's not, in my view, at, at all uncommon for, for people to have a a sense of disconnect with, with where the leadership is going, and people always want individualized attention. Um, what Are there organizations that you would seek us to model after? I mean, are there two or three that, that we could look at and investigate, or, uh, I mean, clearly we can go through and, and, and address some of the issues that you brought up, mm -hmm. but on a broader sense, you know, I mean, th these are more deeper cultural issues that, that, that drive these. Um, are, are there so I wouldn't dare to try to answer that question on the on the fly here like this, but um, I think what I'm speaking to is there has been uh, there's definitely been, it's been lo I think they're low and there's been a decline and it keeps getting worse. And you're right, we've had all kinds of things happen, but how we handle it. I mean, are we handling it, everything, all of these things that I just listed, are we doing the best that we can here on this? And this is where it's coming from. I guess my response is, you know, I, I think these are not great and um, they've gone down. And, I, I, and like I mentioned these different examples, it's like there are so many ways that we could do better. I do want to clarify uh, one thing about, no one's asking that the department chairs don't have training. The, the question that has even been mentioned is just that a number of them have come forward and said, you know, they're like, it's a week when I'm off contract, it's 40 hours, it's supposed to come, it's additional to what I've been done in the past as chair. There's nothing wrong with having it. I'm all for it. I'm all for the training. It's the fact that they're not being compensated <coughs> anything specifically for that week. It's just being rolled in to what they were getting for being a chair that's on call you know, whenever, and it is a full week of their summer that is off their nine-month contract if they're a nine-month employee, and so that was my example. So it's not that they're not wanting training. It's not, I mean, I don't know, some of them might not want training, but I think that they should have it. I totally support it. It's the added on thing. It's a, This is a small thing, but these little things add up to, these are people that are investing and in taking leadership positions you know, voluntarily, really, um, in in their different departments, and um, 
And so I'm just saying like little things that the college can do that make a difference in morale. That was just an example. Um, as far as the definition of shared governance, um, when you say that everybody agreed to it, I'll just say that it was presented to all of us as this is what it will be for the college. And it was never at a place where anybody was asked to solicit, like give feedback or, or input into it. It was this is what it will be. So um, just to clarify that, just to make sure we're sticking with facts, is that that document that you discussed was not, there was no faculty input into the drafting of that document. So there was, here is what we're gonna work from, here you go. So I just wanna, I just wanna make sure we're talking about the same things here, and that's, that's what we're talking about. So whether or not there should have been faculty input, we could have that debate later, but I'm just saying that's the reality of it. So to say that there's a bunch of buy-in or that we agreed to it or voted on it or something, that's not true. It was just we were given it. So I just think that you, um, I just want to encourage all of our leadership to really think about the battles that they choose with faculty. Um, it, are they worth it? And what, what message does it send about valuing your employees? Um, and also, you know, in what ways are you giving input, uh, allowing for input and in process? Is it after it's all been done, then you're going to show it to us, and then we can complain about it, and you'll have a listening session, and then you'll not change anything, and this is already what it's going to be? Is that sheer governance? Is that, is that what you think it is? So if that's what the direction that this institution's going, you're going to continue to have complaints from faculty. So I don't want to go on in a big rant at some more, but I'm just being honest. That's Dr. That's Harvey, what I'm thanks. You're in a difficult position, and you've got a lot of viewpoints from your staff and from the faculty, and uh, we appreciate that. Okay. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have we'll a have question for Trustee discussion. Snyder. I'm it, sorry. Can I have a question for Trustee Snyder with his mm -hmm. comment that he made? So you mentioned that you've looked at other corporations and their statistics on employee engagement survey. What is an appropriate percentage that would be alarming for them? I don't have any of that data in front of me. Just. I've gone through these types of surveys at past organizations, and I could probably track some of that down, but I don't know offhand. I, I'd like to see something like that to see what's, what you're comparing that to, because, I mean, Judy Corr, who was the last internal auditor, um, felt that 15% was enough to uh, initiate these surveys uh, to collect data to understand what's going on, and we have not since hired um, an internal auditor since that time, and that position's actually been disbanded. So uh, for we, me, we do have an internal audit committee. And I don't know that Judy Corb was an internal auditor, but we have a whole internal audit. The team. organizational chart shows an external person that's not underneath the president that reports to the board. Oh, the whole structure and that though, person, has been right. changed. That but then changed. we don't have checks and balances. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. How so? Well, we have a whole internal audit team uh, that meets with a lot of departments, and that whole team is a checks and balance. Now, if you're talking about a specific item on HR, uh, I don't know that HR has changed. It's just a matter of how people report. So the organizational flowchart showed an internal audit service, and there was an executive position that was just for us. It was not connected to anybody else, dotted line to the president, so there's a relationship but that no longer is there on the flow chart. There, that, there's nobody hiring that position that's been disseminated under the president, so the information flows up through one person. The audit department has nothing to do with the engagement study. The audit department, which is now headed by Justin McDade, I believe has several other people in that department, and their responsibility is to perform audits throughout the campus on various processes and procedures. It reports directly to the chair but there is a dotted line to me as kind of a supervisor. I have no input um, what as far as he's, he's doing. Dr. Korb was the EVP whose responsibilities also were HR. And that is how um, I think when it's kind of miswritten mis, uh, uh, in what I saw. She's not an auditor. She wasn't an auditor. And so the engagement study started in, was that staff development? Um, the 2005 one? With the employee engagement, um, in 2005. Well, it was one of the a, one of the 13 AQIP projects, 
and the two executive vice presidents each had some of those 13 projects that then went to a chair that chaired a committee. And so Dr. Korb, I'm, I'm, Dr. Korb would have had the employee engagement project that they started the research on and then implemented in 2015 as an AQIP project. Then again right. in 17 and then operationalized it in 19. So. Right. So who is that executive director of the internal audit? Because online it says it's fake. Justin McDade. And if it's um, thank you, Austin. Oh. I'm Justin McDade. I'm currently the director of internal audit and advisory services. Okay. And um, I, I think it, what you might be referring to is the current organizational chart mm -hmm. as it's uh, on the website for the college. Mm -hmm. And that, that does state that it's vacant, but mm -hmm. I think that is because I recently assumed those duties from Janelle Vogler, who was director of the department prior. And my understanding is that uh, they update that organizational chart maybe once a year or so to reflect all the changes in the organization. So even though it shows vacant right now, I, I can assure you that it is, it is filled. And I work with a staff of uh, two authors and um, I, if you would like at some point, I would be happy to set up a meeting with you and um, show you some of the work that we do and how we function within the college. That'd be great. Certainly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next item is the Johnson County Research Triangle. Trustee Cross could not be with us this evening. We have no report there. So the Kansas Association of Community College Trustees, Trustee Lawson. Paperwork. Okay. Let me just get my bearings. Okay, uh, the KACCT, that's the Kansas Association of Community Colleges of Trustee. Uh, we met on June 7th through the, uh, through the 8th at Barton County Community College. That was uh, very gracious of them to come. And Kate Allen joined us as well. And Dr. Sobchak and Trustee Ingram were there. We voted to move our board member elections to December since the state moved our general elections from the spring to the fall so that the group will now uh, know who the current trustees are in which we can nominate. I made a motion to retain the current board members as interim board until we can vote in December, and that was unanimously voted on. So for us, that means that Trustee Ingram will remain as the secretary of the KECCT until December elections uh, for that board. We also voted to use membership funds, of which JCCC uh, pays $63,604 uh, uh, and will be going down actually to 62025 of uh, public funds to, towards this. Uh, we renewed contracts from KACCT. Uh, one was the placement of an IT contractor who was uh, not really close to where the executive director was living, but in the contract uh, stated that they would be doing on-site repairs. So the concern was the transportation, was there someone maybe closer to this executive director? That contract will not be renewed and options to renegotiate for a flat rate instead of the monthly billing was something that was discussed and moved forward. I also had concerns about the KACC lobbyist. There are still the lobbyists for the organizations that have conflicts with JCC interest. Uh, regarding the clients such as Kansas Coalition for Fair Funding that use the same, yet use this lobbying firm to work uh, to amend the state's constitution to remove equitable and adequate education funding. Here at Johnson County, we have a lot of protections, but our rural partners, uh, the impact on the K through 12 system can be significant. While I knew my vote, no vote would not impact their renewal, I believe one statement of dissent uh, would result in better agreement. In fact, we were able to block a significant pay raise uh, by the lobbyists. We amended the contract to prioritize KACT uh, against any conflicts, so that will be written in the contract. Uh, the second reason I voted no on this contract was because of the continuing efforts that this lobbyist did to use KACCT in the State House attempting to remove teachers' due process. This continues to have a lingering residue as per, as per our results from the employee engagement survey and uh, the distrust in our senior leadership. So that was a concern that I brought up. Um, the third is in the end, the discussion I brought up about my concerns helped to save KACT money and provided, provided a better contract focused on special needs um, of the organization and, of course, the public funds coming from Johnson County residents. We also talked about KBOR. Uh, there was a hefty packet. 
that uh, was given to us about the strategic planning efforts. Uh, I mentioned that there's one thing missing in this that entire packet from the update was a focus on diversity and inclusion. Inclusion. I mentioned that an, in, that an inclusive colleges that embrace diversity is one of the best ways to prepare students for the workplace. Better diversity attracts, of course, young talent to a business and big, business, big industry leaders in our community and have a commitment to diversity and equity already in their workplace. Uh, the executive director had added that to the KCCT uh, and will bring that up in important focus on these areas when they talk with KBOR. The next uh, piece we had is our um, IT department. There was, uh, in Kansas colleges, there's been quite a few that have been targeted for hacking. Uh, we had a representative who worked from the Pentagon that it came to tell us that there were more than trillions of dollars in loss in, um, to be aware of and to make sure that we provide data security for our community. One of the presidents that were impacted mentioned that the level of impact they experienced was greater than the mill levy rollback that they could have provided. I have to agree with that. Does one time benefit of $100 or so go back outweigh the potential devastation that could be unleashed on someone's personal data, mm -hmm. their credit, and their child's credit? The last thing that we talked about was the Senate Bill 155 had a very lively discussion. Uh, we discussed at the KCCT with request to funding for the 2020 education year and the legislative priorities, uh, which was the program to program articulation agreements uh, that Dr. McLeod talked about earlier from community colleges with our higher institutions. I mentioned the importance of adding to the legislative priorities the abilities to add computer science and technology degrees and certifications to this list. That that received broad support from the community colleges in the room, and I'm looking forward to seeing the work of KACCT in the State House. The next meeting is set for September 13th and 14th at Neosho uh, Community College. And then, Trustee Ingram, did you have anything else to add? No, you did yeah. a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That uh, Trustee my report. I, I just want to follow up on one of the comments you made, Trustee Lawson. Uh, um, and maybe this should be directed to Tom on the hacking and security thing. We spend a lot of money on hacking protections, right? And firewalls throughout the college and within the college, right? Yeah. And under the management budget passed last year, are you concerned that we're somehow putting people at risk that their personal identification is gonna be stolen if, no. we, if we don't, if we roll the mill levy back 0.15 mills? No. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and I would say for the full board, uh, again, when we have the quarterly audit meetings, and Justin McCade has spoken, uh, both our internal audit process, but particularly our external audit process, thinks we have some of the finest protection uh, protections in place. And uh, we talked about that at the last meeting report that we gave. So I feel really good that we've got ample resources and great talent in our whole uh, technology field. But... The reality is there certainly is fraud out there, and some of us personally have probably been engaged with that. So um, we're I've been a, victims of it. Victims of it. Not engaged. Not engaged. Yeah, I mean, well, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe the other way. No, victims of it. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, foundation, Trustee Musil. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Foundation's Some Enchanted Evening Sponsorship Committee met on June 6th. They're working hard at connecting individuals and community partners so they can raise money in support of our scholarship programs. Uh, Pam Pop is the sponsorship chair. Mike and Susan Lally are the event chairs for 2019. Um, and thanks to their work, more than 300,000 has already been raised for student scholarships. Uh, it will be held on November 9th, uh, 2019 at the Overland Park Convention Center. And, as, and most people here know that is the largest single scholarship fundraising effort that the college engages in each year. Uh, the Foundation's Executive Committee will meet on June 25. That will be the final Foundation activity under the current chair, uh, Mary Birch. As, or, as Foundation President, we'd like to thank her for her tremendous uh, effort and support, as always. Um, the new president will be Suze Parker, and she will begin her term on July 1. Uh, the Foundation is proud to report that the college recently received a generous gift from the Philip A. and Betty M. Calabrese Trust. A uh, significant gift will be used to establish a new scholarship available to Johnson County Community College students for the upcoming academic year. And generous contributions like this are key to our ability to continue to give more than $1 million in scholarships to students. 
Um, and on behalf of the foundation, I want to thank everybody who contributes through Summit Chan at Evening, through any other scholarship program. I know we recently got a solicitation in the mail as board, board members for the uh, foundation president's uh, scholarship. We get it for our president's scholarship. Whatever you give to, I hope you will you'll find some way to give some money to the foundation so that uh, we can help students afford books, tuition, and other necessities. That concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, the next item is the consent agenda. The consent agenda is an item where we deal with a number of routine items. Uh, if any trustee has an item they'd like to take off the consent agenda, I would entertain that now. If not, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we do have an executive session, uh, another executive session this evening. Uh, I would like to entertain a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of discussing <coughs> an individual employee's performance pursuant to Kansas Open Meetings Act, exception relating to non-elected personnel. The session will last 60 minutes. We would like to invite Joe Sopcich and Tanya Wilson to join us in this executive session. I would entertain a motion. So moved. Lindstrom, seconded by? Second. Musil. Uh, we will, uh, it's 728, can you take a break and be back at 740? 735. 735? We'll start at 735. <laughs>We are back in open session. Uh, we need to return to executive session, um, once I find the paper here, to um, discuss an individual employee's performance pursuant to the Kansas Open Meetings Act, exception relating to non-elected personnel. Uh, this session will last up to 60 minutes and not exceed 60 minutes. Uh, we would like to invite Joe Sopcich and Tanya Wilson to join us, and uh, I would like to entertain a motion to do so. So move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, this session will officially start at 837 and uh, not to exceed one hour. Did you get that, Terry? Thanks. We are back from executive session uh, in open session. Uh, we have one, uh, no action was taken in executive session, uh, but we have one uh, item of business to take. Uh, I would like to entertain a motion, uh, the recommendation of the Board of Trustees that the College President's Employment Agreement be approved uh, in a new four-year contract as, as presented. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. We have a one, two, three, four, five to one vote, and uh, it is approved. Uh, I will move for adjournment. You ask for a motion, you mean? I'm sorry? Can Would you, you like a motion? I'd like a motion for I adjourn. would move that we a non-debatable motion to <laughs> debate. Yeah, I mean, to adjourn. Second. Seconded. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. We are adjourned. Thank you.